Rocks News Network, digging up the dirt on what you need to know. Now here to fill you in on today's top story is America's number one anchor, Matt Mintz. Thank you, boys. Today we brought in Brittany Olmsted and Carolyn Curran to discuss the similarities and differences between the Red River flooding and the 1994 Georgia flooding. And hopefully they'll be able to provide some insight onto how this can be prevented into the future. I want a corn dog. The 1994 flooding in central Georgia was a result of the tropical storm Alberto, a slow moving system which in turn caused the rains to linger. Not only that, but the grounds were already saturated from previous flash flooding were now at risk. The July 4th through 14th storm affected five major rivers throughout the southern United States, centralizing in Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. By July 6th, the system reached Georgia and within 24 hours dropped 12 to 15 inches of rain. The flooding caused over $500 million in damages throughout central Georgia. 27% of Georgia's counties were deemed a federal disaster area. The disastrous flooding reached nearly 27 inches in some cities. The water treatment plant and the sewage center flooded, making the water undrinkable throughout the state. As far as structural damage, over 100 dams were harmed, five major dams burst, and there was forced closure of nearly 175 roads. 20,000 sandbags were used in an attempt to try and stabilize the river. The Army Corps of Engineers used two three-man teams to bring in sandbags, but a lack of task force officers caused increased insufficiency and a slow recovery. A large portion of the damage can be attributed to bad city planning. This is because the Flint River runs through several towns which resulted in the cities being divided, leaving half of their supplies on one side and half on the other. Better emergency planning should have been instated, especially before or during hurricane season, because rivers surround the cities and they are in a basin. Looting also took place within the city because of the mass panic among the public. This could have been prevented with better planning by the government to educate the public on disaster training and recovery. Also, another factor was the chain of command's ignorance regarding their roles in the disaster. Police officers sometimes took on the role of bystanders, so the city should take steps to better train their workers for situations such as this. One step the city has done to prevent damages like this to occur again is an imposed 1% tax to help update the, the emergency channels in the area to help with emergency response. Most of the damage is attributed to the breaking of the dams increasing the water flow further downstream, thus causing more dams to be damaged or broken. Dams and levees should be inspected more thoroughly and accurately to find weaknesses so they can be fixed so the disasters like this don't happen again. Government officials and regulators should be held responsible for their utilization of disaster plans and damage control regulation in these times of natural disasters. Although the city wasn't quite prepared for this disaster, they have taken steps to prevent and be better prepared for the next natural event to surprise these sleeping towns. Well, that was interesting. Let's see what the other expert has to say. The Red River, which is a northward flowing river stretching from Breckenridge, Minnesota to the Providence of Manitoba in Canada, floods almost every year. The levee floods due to runoff from the mountains because spring thaw comes down from the river at the same time that the river is being stopped up by ice blocks, which slow down the water flow enough that it floods the nearby town. The town of Fargo receives a large amount of damage due to the flat land and the frozen saturated ground from the snow in the area. The decreasing gradient downstream causes the water to slow down and get stopped up by ice blocks, and as a result, start flooding the area nearby. In 1997, the most severe Red River flood occurred since 1826 in Grand Forks, North Dakota. 50,000 people had to be evacuated from their homes, and the town suffered $3.5 billion in damages. Earlier that year, the National Weather Service predicted that the river would crest no higher than 49 feet, and thus the levees were built to withhold that maximum level of water. However, in April of that year, the Red River water level hit 54.35 feet. The results were devastating, and the water drainage was so slow that some people couldn't reach their property for weeks. They have yet to figure out a way to prevent the flooding from the river from happening. However, the towns in the area are very effective at responding to the disaster because it happens so often. The towns prevent some flooding by blowing up ice jams with dynamite to keep the river flowing. They also put sandbags around their house to help prevent or lessen the damage done to their house. The levee has been found ineffective and they should either build a bigger one or just move away. Currently, the Army Corps of Engineers is working on a plan to divert the river away from the town. Plans are said to be released in February, 
and are going to be shown to town officials for approval. The issue that Fargo keeps running into is that instead of preventing the problem, they are merely reacting to it by putting out sandbags to lessen the damage. The city has made other improvements, such as higher standards when it comes to building codes. Also, the city has improved its sewer system so that when it floods, it doesn't flood out into the streets as well. Not only has the city improved its infrastructures to handle these events, but it also offers its citizens federal flood insurance because the price of flood insurance on the individual is too high. Although they are making their town more flood resistant, the issue, the issue will continue happening until they find a way to prevent the river from flooding. So ladies, these floods occurred hundreds of miles apart. Could there be any similarities? Yes, Matt. These flooding situations are located very far apart and are very different types. But the most prominent similarity is that they were both caused by natural disasters. One with melting ice rushing down mountainsides, and the other having warm torrential rain lingering for days. Actually, if you think about it, another similarity between the floods is that a levee and dam failure occurred in both locations, which magnified the devastating effects. That's exactly right, Brittany. And I'd say that the most serious differences are evident through the ways that the communities prepared for these disasters. Because the flood in Georgia was caused mainly by a hurricane, the residents were completely unprepared, and in the aftermath of the flooding, a lot of looting occurred. Communities along the Red River, however, experience this kind of flooding every single year, and so they're well-practiced at coming together and readying their town for the rising water levels to come. Back to you, Matt. Wow. I feel like my brain's about to explode, and it hasn't even been... 10 minutes? Would you guys like to leave any advice for the audience, especially if they live along the Flint or Red River? Well, for the people along the Flint or Newelgy Rivers, number one, I would suggest improved city planning. Now that you know what the river floods are capable of, you can develop better building codes. Two, improve emergency planning. You normally have days notice before hurricanes, so start early with sandbagging and other preparations. Three, Improve emergency personnel training. At no time should they be simply bystanders. I'd recommend very similar points for the people that live along the Red River. But also, since these residents know that the floods are coming every single year, remember to start planning early to help prevent the floods damage with things like sandbagging. And also, inspecting levees and dams would not hurt in either case. That's all we've got for you tonight, folks. Hope you learned something you didn't already know. Special thanks to our references. Tune in tomorrow's 11 o'clock broadcast to hear political rock star Sarah Palin debate the existence of dinosaurs and its effects on the non-existence of global warming.